I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. All right, guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Dr. Mike Swinborne, postdoctoral researcher specialising in wombats, and Dr. Elise Swinborne, postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Adelaide, also specialising in wombats. You can see a theme. Welcome, guys. Ah, thanks. Good day. How's it going? Yeah, very well, thank you. So, you're obviously a couple, and you're both into wombats. That's interesting. Yeah. How could you not be into wombats? They're such fascinating animals. You like wombats, don't you, Steve? You don't mind them. Yeah. <laughs> may have been mentioned a few times on the show before. <laughs> I've got to be honest, I've, obviously I've got a pet wombat called Snuffles. And before I got Snuffles, I was terrified of wombats. Just from the stories I've heard of wombats snapping Achilles tendons, bowling people over... They're terrifying, and I mean, my wombat's okay with me now. I'm sort of getting over it, but yeah. For now, yeah. They're, they're so charismatic animals, but yes, they can turn on you like that. It's, it's pretty crazy. And their claws and their teeth, they can be quite uh, scary, especially males. But yeah, they're really adorable animals as well. Good, good for a scratch. Yeah, she, yeah. Does, she loves a scratch. And yours, uh, I've always been scared of wombats. I love them. I think they're amazingly shaped animals everything about them i just think they're the bulldog of the wildlife world um, but you getting snuffles didn't stop me from being scared of them because <laughs> snuffles has bit me <laughs> yeah, yeah she, they've got a nasty bite haven't they, they well th- there was a uh, a case oh, recently uh, a woman in canberra was attacked by a wombat and nearly killed by it she thought um i, I think it's probably a slight exaggeration but she came off second best and I was interviewed on the radio probably six months ago about another wombat attack uh, at a zoo in Queensland. So, yeah, they can be nasty if they feel like it. My, um, my cousin, she worked at the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary and she got bitten by a wombat when she was doing her placement and this bruise on her leg was the size of a dinner plate. It can be quite intense. No, I have a healthy respect for wombats, beautiful animals. And have you guys specialised in any particular species? We have three species of wombat in the world, in Australia. Is there a particular species you guys have worked with? Well, that's correct, yeah. There's three species. There's the northern hairy-nosed wombat, which uh, is a critically native animal in Queensland. Uh, the common wombat, or bear-nosed wombat, as people prefer to call it these days, <laughs> because it's, they don't like common animals. And that's on the eastern seaboard and uh, into Tasmania. And the southern hairy-nosed wombat, which is in South Australia. And, of course, we live in South Australia, so we specialise in the southern hairy-nosed wombat. That's your guy. And that's, that's what Snuffles is, the southern hairy-nosed wombat. Yeah, she was from the Gawler Ranges. Just incidentally, she was a rescue. So uh, South Australia, we have, do we have the commons? They come into the southeast of the state, do they? Or? They do. They used to come oh, a long time ago. They used to come all the way along the coast up from um, Mount Gambier up along the Coorong. Uh, but they have sort of disappeared from much of that range, and you can still find them down around the Mount Gambier area, but uh, they have only very, very small numbers in South Australia. Yeah, OK. I called them common, didn't I? I'm going to get in trouble for that. People <laughs> no, get funny about it. It's not, not nice. <laughs> people are, fu- people <laughs> are funny about it, and, uh, yeah, they will correct you, no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. And look, and I, and, and I understand, too, because I'm not a fan of the term common, like your common brush tail possum and, and this and that, but at the same time... I'm not happy with any of the other names, like the bald-nosed wombat, you know? Can it just be the wombat and the, the hairy-nosed wombat and the wombat? Bear-nose. Bear-nose is all right? Bear-nose, yeah. So it's OK? Well, back in the dim, dark past, uh, when uh, uh, European settlers first arrived in Australia, there was just wombats, and until we arrived in uh, South Australia and found that, that they were different animals, and they were initially called plains wombats uh, because the uh, bear-nosed wombat uh, tends to live in forests, uh, and things like that, whereas the southern hairy nose and the northern hairy nose both prefer open grasslands. Very few of them in the trees, so they uh, call them plains wombats to start with. That's interesting, because I've heard the bear nose wombat, happy, <laughs> um, <laughs> called the um, forest wombat. So that's interesting, because so the southern hairy nose wombat, he's <clears> across <throat> the, like, the limestone country, isn't he? Yeah, so you go uh, all the way across South Australia and into Western Australia, from about halfway to Perth from the border, uh, a place called uh, Kaiguna, and all the way across the Nullarbor. Uh, there's populations uh, in the Gawler Ranges, as you, as you know, from Snuffles. Uh, there's some on the Eyre Peninsula, York Peninsula, and the Murray Land. So, yes, they do live in the limestone country. They do uh, prefer that sort of environment, but they do f- other areas as well. The Gawler Ranges isn't quite as limey, obviously. It's the granite mountains and things like that. So you find a few amongst there as well. 
Okay. Um, and we've had a lot of droughts recently and they live in the dry country. Has that affected them a lot? The drought does affect them. They are. In- interestingly enough, they're probably one of the best arid adapted mammals in the world. Uh, they use very little water. They don't actually drink much water, only after rain. Perhaps if there's a few puddles around, they get most of the, the water from the plants they eat. Uh, but droughts affect their ability to breed. Uh, the young really need about two reasonable years of rain to survive to maturity. And if they don't get it, they die. So with like the droughts we've had over the last few years, none of the young would have survived that uh, drought, or very few of them would have. We still issue out coal permits for wombats. Do you think that's a mistake, or is that something we shouldn't talk about? No, it's a, very important to talk about it. Uh, culling, you've got to say, culling is an important management tool, uh, and without culling, we would be overrun by wombats, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but it has to be done, uh, first of all, in a humane manner, uh, but it also has to take into account the populations and the population dynamics at the time, uh, making sure that the, uh, that the area, uh, there's still wombats in the area and they can you know, move between different colony groups and you're not cutting off small populations from each other. Uh, but, yeah, they do need to take a more holistic view of how they go about culling. They can't just you know, issue culling permits willy-nilly. Yeah, there was one put in recently for 200 animals and I think that... I think people protested that one and they took it back. I was heavily involved in that. Uh, not the, not the authorisation of the permit, uh, but I was uh, involved in the discussions about whether it was appropriate or not uh, and was going to go out there and do an assessment on the size of the population. Um, 200 animals. There's only about 800 animals on the whole of the York Peninsula. So a cull of 200 would have absolutely decimated the population. Mm, OK. And especially, if, like you say, if they don't breed, if they don't get enough rain, and we're mm. a few years into a drought, aren't we? Exactly. Uh, that's the wild animals. I think some of the animals in farmland will survive because, obviously, the, you know, some might be irrigated pastures or the pasture grasses are better than some of the wild grasses. So they don't do too bad in some of these areas. But, um, yeah, you do, do need to take into account things like the drought. I do feel for the farmers, though, because, I mean, their burrows, not like the common wombats that might have one or two little tunnels, they build these huge rooms under the ground, don't they, and you can lose a tractor into them. You don't see them until you're right on top of them, neither do you. Yeah. <laughs> Just amazing systems. Mm. Particularly cropland farmers, they're the ones that have the biggest problems with wombats. Now, grazing is not so much a big issue, um, although, you know, obviously they'll take out land that could be used by the sheep. But the last thing you want, if you're, a, say, a wheat farmer or whatever is to be driving your tractor along, harvesting your crop and then disappear down a wombat hole. Uh, not only will it damage the tractor, you, know, you, you can't, can no longer harvest your crop and it can cost them tens of thousands of dollars if, for cases like that. Why do they make such big... Like, I've, I've been into <coughs> some of these wombat warrens. Are they called warrens? You've been inside one? Yeah, there's one that... You're braver um, than me. Near yeah, Yukamura. Game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we went past one on, uh, sort of up behind Yukamura Sanctuary and um, there was a wombat sitting in the middle of the day next to it. I thought, is that dead? Like, it was really dusty-looking wombat sunning itself. And it wasn't until we went right up to it that it saw us and almost like a cartoon went, and just bolted down, the, <laughs> down into this um, chamber. And, yeah, we, we could walk into this huge, like, a room with, like, tunnels coming off it. Like, it's hmm. pretty extensive. What, that, that could be a big old system, couldn't it? Some of those systems uh, in those limestone country, like Yukamara, uh, up there near Blanchetown and places like that, uh, they can be centuries old, and they've had generations of wombats which have modified it and enlarged it. And uh, once you get it underneath that uh, limestone, it's like having a nice concrete roof uh, for your house. It's never going to collapse. It's never going to fall down. And so they can live in there for generations and generations and have a nice, stable and very large uh, tunnel system. Uh, I did a project a while ago where I used ground-penetrating radar to have a look at the underside of some of these um, uh, Burrows. And I called it like the London Underground, just massive chambers with tunnels and things going everywhere. Why do they have such a big, massive chamber at the beginning? Like, what's the point of that? Is that just how it evolves over time with all the traffic coming through? Well, it's possible that uh, in some of these areas they're actually making use of existing caverns underneath the limestone. Um, but as I say, they've been there for a very long time and uh, with generations of wombats. bats. Uh, because of the limestone, they can't just dig wherever they feel like. They have to take advantage of the few cracks and breaks in the limestone where they occur. And so you might have a lot of wombats using one break. And so they don't all, don't all want to live in close proximity to each other. They want to have their own little 
house, so to speak. It's almost like an apartment, underground apartment complex. So one will live over here, one will live over there, one will live you know, a few metres away from each other. How far do they go in from, from the main entrance? We've seen them up to about 25, 30 metres at times. Wow. Uh, that's, that's, that's probably a bit above average, but 10, 15 metres would be normal. Do they actually dig through the limestone? They're, they're that strong to go through stone? and They can't or? physically break a sh- through a sheet, but if there's a crack and thing, they can uh, leverage out the cracks and make the cracks and things larger, yeah, for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. And you'll often see... Uh, at the entrance to some of these uh, limestone uh, burrows, you'll see big chunks of limestone just lying on the ground where they've dug them out. Probably very persistent. <laughs> they are. And in fact, that's an important... What, doing this is a very important part of the ecosystem. They bring these rocks up to the surface where they, they're weathered by the wind and rain. And if you have a look at some of, the, some of these um, uh, limestone burrows, uh, you'll see this nice area of you know, red clay soil and there's sort of white mound with you know, progressively small rocks as you get further away from the burrow, as over time the big rocks have been weathered away and washed away by the rain and wind. Bringing nutrients up to the surface. Exactly, yeah. And it allows water to get down underground, so it's a very, very important part of the ecosystem. Wombats are very important for the ecosystem health. We heard a lot about them during the bushfires recently, didn't we? With um, I, I think some of the reports were exaggerated where they had wombats shepherding other animals into the... Come into my burrow for help. I don't think that happened, did it? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, look, that probably occurred because someone saw either a wombat following an animal down inside or you know, and, and, and a wombat going first and an animal following inside and they sort of got this nice romantic notion that the wombats were helping other animals. I mean, the, the burrows are important, and a lot of other animals will shelter in wombat warrens, but I'm pretty confident the wombats weren't outside giving them tickets to go inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an amazing adaptation, though, isn't it? Like, I, when I talk to the school kids and I've got snuffles in a classroom, you know, you just imagine how hot it is in the sun. Like, on a, on a really hot day, then it's going to be amplified out where the wombats live, and there's not much shade out there. So it's an incredibly important adaptation to get under the ground. You've suddenly, like you say, got this roof over you, and it must be infinitely cooler down there. They average about 26 degrees inside their burrows on really hot days. It's a nice, stable environment, a bit like a wine cellar. If you, you, know, you put your wine down in a cellar under the house so that it stays at a constant temperature all the time, wombat warrants are the same. So even if it's cold outside, it's uh, nice and snugly and warm inside. But if it's really hot, like on a nullarbor, it's 45 degrees outside, it's still 25 degrees down inside the burrow. Do they use any bedding? Looks like I've got potteries and bedongs and they carry bedding in their tail. Wombats, their tails are pathetic. Um, <laughs> do they do anything with that tail, by the way, <laughs> incidentally? <laughs> yeah, look like an echidna. Yeah. If, you turn, if you turn a southern hairy nose wombat around, and I've got a photo to show this, and you put googly eyes on their backside and their little stupid tail looks like an echidna. <laughs> There's a game for you at home, kids. Um, so, yeah, because they must make a bit of a bed. There's just a bit of soil in there or... Look, to be honest, I have never crawled all the way down inside to have a look. Possibly use you know straw or straw or some grass or something like that as, as a as a bed. But to be quite honest, I don't know if they do or not. Yeah, Rocky Zoo when they had um, they had their wombat population that they were researching, they would put hessian sacks in there for bedding, and some used them and some didn't, and they just kind of end up with just a pile just pushed up against the, the barrier of their sleeping chamber. Yeah. So I don't think they snuggle into it like, yeah, adorable potteries or betongs. I think yeah. it's just... I see, I, I give, because I give snuffles, because she's, um, I, at night time I bring her inside. I've got like a big, like a room I've built in my room for her. And she's got some blankets down and she's got this huge pouch. And if it's a cold night, she'll go into the pouch. It's pretty cool. It's funny how you, <laughs> the, the, funny how hand-raised animals, even though when they're adults, they still return to the pouch. Uh, I used to raise kangaroos and wombats when I was uh, in a previous life. Uh, and if we ever wanted to round up the animals, even though they were juveniles and almost adults, if you just held their pouch out, they would come and roll into the pouch. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. You, not something you would see in the wild, but it's, it's something they seem, seem to do for yeah. the raised animals. Yeah. So sometimes she's just got her head in there. Nothing else, just her head. Just temperature regulating. Yeah. <laughs> Does yeah. the snuffle sleep on his back? <laughs> uh, sometimes, sometimes you'll see her on her back. And yeah. the swimming? And the swimming. Yeah, the kick in the leg. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty adorable. So she's about two now. What am I in for? 
It's like terrible twos, I suppose. Yeah, they're going to try and test your boundaries. But I guess being a female, um, like the woman I used to work with where I did my PhD, she, her boys, she'd kind of have to keep them separate and things like that. And she'd be more intimate and cuddly with the girls after that two years. So you might still get away with a big cuddle and, and, you know, we saw she had a wombat wiggles and, you know, she's 10 years old and she could still go in and cuddle her and wiggles would be so cute there. Um, but then, you know, she had four-year-old boys and you just would not go in there. They would, they would try and jump over the barrier and come at you and you're like, whoa, calm down. They, they get weaned from their mum at about 18 months of age. Uh, that's when they start sort of leaving home or actually, uh, interestingly enough, the interesting fact about wombats, when the, when the uh, young is weaned, the, the baby stays behind and the mum leaves. Um, there's a tip for all you teenagers out there to tell your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, because uh, the young animals are not quite so capable of doing things like building a new burrow and things like that, and whereas mum is much more capable. So she'll leave the baby behind and go somewhere else. Make a sacrifice. Wow. Mm. Yeah, so they tend to keep in their maternal burrow. Mm. And so 18 months of age to two years, they're sort of starting to get their independence. So you probably, it's almost like you've got a teenage wombat there. So that's um, so the I have way to, to look at it. Yeah. I have to move out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give her the house. She owns the house now, yeah. yeah. How many, in these systems, how many would tend to live in one, one system? Well, uh, wombats are sort of semi-social. That's probably okay. the best way of describing it. Uh, they're not social animals where they'll all want to get in a nice close room, but they will live in um, their own little chambers and things in a multi-room uh, burrow. Like a um, tolerable cohabit. Yeah, almost like yeah, almost like a shared house, I yeah. suppose. There's probably a good way of, of looking at it. Um, males tend to cohabit better than females do, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, at male, not males of the same family, not males from a different family. They'll fight, uh, but brothers and... Um, you know, fathers and sons tend to get on very well and they'll actually share uh, a house. Uh, but in these big chamber things, you might have, uh, on average, you might have, say, 10, 15 on a, on a big warren and you might have, say, five wombats down there at any one time. Are they all, would they be related? Would that all be family members? or The males would tend to be family members. The females would probably be from a, a you know, closely related... Because wombats are not the sort of animal that migrates huge distances so um, you know all the animals in a say a, a relatively small area would probably be related as cousins or something like that um, so yeah they're related but not closely related mm -mm. Growing up I always used to hear that the northern hairy nose wombat is one of the most critically endangered mammals on earth is that still the case today? Yeah, so um, last check, Alan Horsop, we, he came to a wombat conference last year? Two years. Two years ago, Two years, there yeah. you go. Um, and so he gave us an update of their numbers, and they're just over 300 um, now at shared between Epping um, and St George. So in the wild? In the wild. So actually, what's <laughs> they're technically not in the wild, they're in a protected area with uh, fox and dog fencing. So they're actually in like a free range population and then St George is the same. So there's actually, they're technically not in the, in the wild per se because they are protected from predators uh, and during droughts they're fed supplementary feed and also provided with additional water sources. There's been a very, um, a very intensive effort to recover the northern hairy nose over the last probably yes. 25, 30 years because uh, when they did their final or their first major assessment in the 80s, they reckon there's only about 30 of them. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's almost an unsurvivable population, but really uh, with the intensive efforts they've managed to bring the numbers up to... You know, is that down to predators or is it the, the lack of water? The biggest, the biggest problem for wombats uh, of all time has been rabbits. Um, rap when the rabbit plagues came through in the late 19th century, early 20th century, it absolutely decimated the wombat population across the country. Uh, not just because of the competition, because uh, the rabbits just ate everything and there was nothing left for the uh, wombats to eat, uh, but they also, one of the only ways to get rid of rabbits was to destroy their warrens. Um, and as a consequence of that, wombats became collateral damage. Uh, there's a hole in the ground, bulldoze it, there could be a rabbit hole. And in those days, it was almost certainly wombats, rabbits down in the wombat holes anyway. Uh, so the farmers would destroy all the wombat warrens to um, get rid of. 
uh, rabbits. In fact, the northern hairy nosed wombat, uh, that one of the reasons why it is so endangered, uh, there used to be quite a sizable population in southern New South Wales, uh, in, in, around a place called Gerildery, sort of the New South Wales Riverina. But there was actually a bounty placed on the head of the wombats, five shillings a head, uh, and uh, within 13 years, a population that I estimate was probably 20, 30,000 animals uh, was gone, completely gone. Wow. A bit like the thylacine. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, we, delibe- we actually deliberately killed the northern hairy nose wombat. No two ways about that. Are they very different to the southern hairy nose to, like, to look at? Uh, yeah, so they're slightly larger. Um, they've got, <laughs> like, panned eyes. They've got these black rings around their eyes. And they're, I think they're lighter in colour. They're a bit more tan. But essentially they do look very similar, the, the nose, the silky fur on their nose. Yeah, to an uneducated person, well, say, yeah. well, un, not uneducated, <laughs> you know what I mean, <laughs> and not an expert on hairy nose wombats. To Steve. Uh, oh. yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, would, you would have a great deal of difficulty distinguishing between the two, but to an expert, you go, oh, that's a northern hairy nose, that's a southern hairy nose. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've looked at images and I'd, I wouldn't be able to pick it, but that's good to I'll look yeah, at for the... Yeah, there's subtle differences, yeah. Eyes mm-hmm. and, yeah. And when you say the big... I mean, because what's the heaviest wombat ever measured, like, weighed? <laughs> 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 Sorry, um, in, in captivity, the woman that I worked with, she um, she had Foxy, and Foxy was pushing 30, 40 38 kilos? Ki- 38 kilos, I 38 think, 38 yeah. kilos, so he was a big boy. Um, and, and that's the southern hairy nose, they're the smallest wombat. The, yeah. Wow. Gee. So that was up there with the, the northern sort of heaviness. So they're in your, your larger 35, 40 kilo mm. range, whereas down, um, your southerns, your females are probably around your 20, low 20s, and your boys would be about 27 kilos, give mm. or take. That's kind of your average. Mm. OK. We have seen... We have seen... Uh, and they kind of just range yeah, outside of wild, the Wild animals, as you might imagine, are not quite as big as your, your, your fat <laughs> domesticated animals. Uh, uh, so... But it, you would typically think that a, um, uh, a southern hairy nose would be, say, up to about 30, a common one up to about 35, and a northern hairy nose up to about 40. That's yeah. the sort of scale of the difference yeah, between okay. the three species. Well, snuffles is about 15. Hmm. Yeah, so that's really good for a juvenile. And that's really heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah mm. they're like... Um, they're, so compact that they just feel heavier than they even are. Yeah, yeah. and they're like a bulldozer. Like we live on a on a slope, and and because I I let her go outside and she's got a big enclosure she runs around in and everything else, and in the evening I'll go open the door and let her you know, come into the house, and most of the time she just sort of walks into the house, across the property into the house. But this, she's going to do that whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, that's right through the door. Um, but the other night she decided that she wanted a bit of an adventure, and she just started heading straight down the slope. So I jumped in there with her, worried she's going to start rolling down the hill because it's a fairly steep slope. But she's like a an earth moving machine, like like a tank just cruising down this hill, and I'm sliding like, you know, yeah. Well, uh, to tell you how here's, here's a little story to tell you how tough wombats are. Uh, we a colleague of mine uh, was out doing wombatting one day in a, in a... We used to go spotlighting in a ute where we used to go at night looking, counting wombats. Um, and uh, the ute was driving along and suddenly just went down, broke through a wombat hole, uh, a burrow that, that just didn't know it was there. And they all got out and had a look. Uh, and would you believe the unluckiest wombat in the world was right underneath where the car broke through and it was just wheel of the car was just sitting on the on, on the wombat's head and we thought oh how terrible you know, what, what are we going to do we eventually got the car off the wombat uh and about five minutes later the wombat shook itself got up and walked away <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're pretty tough animals i believe that i believe i've heard stories about cars that have hit wombats and the cars have been upside down on the wombat walk so i don't know how yeah, true they are it just but kind of shakes it off and off it goes I don't know about knocking a car upside down. That might be. Yeah, that's, I think that's, yeah. that's probably a bit of an exaggeration because uh, I've seen plenty of dead wombats on the side of the road, unfortunately, but, uh, uh, and not too many wrecked cars next to them. But, uh. <laughs> so I've got, a, I've got it for another 20-odd years, do you think? Yeah. yeah. The, the longest in the wild they live... Well, 20 years is not, not unusual. We, we actually caught a tagged wombat uh, that not only was... Uh, was was tagged 18 years before and it uh, was a young adult then, so this animal would have been at least 20 years old when we caught it again. 
It had a pouch young, so it was still breeding at 20 years of age. Um, and uh, wombats in captivity have been known to live 35 odd years. So, mm. wow, you're gonna, you've got a long you're time in companion a long there. Wall. Yeah, <laughs> might outlive me. Definitely outlive you. She's <laughs> <laughs> healthier. <laughs> We're gonna bring you back to um, when the when the young are weaned and the the mum leaves. Do they go just to a new burrow system, or will they actually create their own new habitat? Uh, so the maternal. The maternal burrow is kind of where the mum is, it's kind of its regular home. And then from there, the, the pouch young, it's like understood that the pouch young will then kind of expand from that area, whether it will, because um, some wombats choose to dig, some don't, like it's a personal preference, I suppose. Um, some just are optimistic and they will just go and find other warren systems, um, whereas others will actually probably try and excavate some of their mm. own, um, um, uh, their own um, home. The Southern Hairy Nose Wombats don't have just one burrow. No. They um, will, uh, we, we have um, done research on them and seen up using up to 10 different burrows, um, an average of about five. Uh, so they do move from one to the other. They have one which they spend the majority of the time, let's say two thirds of the time, and then they'll visit other ones. Uh, so when the mother leaves, she'll probably go to perhaps one of her other burrows, uh, or if, you know, if there's it just depends on what the population's like. If there's empty burrows around, she'll probably occupy one. If there's no empty ones around, she'll have to dig her own. Would she be accepted into another colony easily? or? Well, because she does tend to roam around, uh, she's well known in the area anyway. Uh, so, yeah, there'd be no problem with moving around. Mm. Uh, and unless, they have, unless the population has got, become so you know, dense in the area because there's been so many births, and that happens sometimes, then she'll have to go further afield, and that might cause some consternation. Hmm. So they have like one baby a year? Uh, yeah, so one, uh, they produce one pouch young and then they raise it until weaning. So, yeah. hmm. They really, realistically speaking, they can probably only have one every two years hmm. because they can't have another one until the one's weaned. We have seen cases where they might have um, you know, two every three years, but that's sort of pushing the friendship. So one every two years is more typical. We are still essentially still occupying the pouch most of the through the next breeding season it'll be in and out of the pouch during the breeding season so it's just not possible for it to breed so it snuffles sleeps a lot like yeah. an awful lot yeah. and they're related to koalas mm -hmm. what's the, the the average amount that they should be sleeping uh, so my phd i found when i was doing the behavioral analysis i was finding that wombats were sleeping between 16 to 20 hours a day so um wow that yeah. checks out that yeah. checks out <laughs> Um, well, their diet isn't, they don't have a very high energy diet and they've got a really low um, metabolic rate, so they don't need a lot of energy to function. So basically, because they're eating low energy feed and then they're not really required to do much, what else are you going to do? You're going to sleep during the day. So, yeah. They're pretty lazy animals. They don't yeah. really tend to move very far from their burrow. Yeah. And they'll go as far as they need to eat and then they it. go home back to sleep. And it's funny because when she does move around, she can move really, really fast, you know. So it's like she's conserving all that energy. It's insane when, when you watch her and she, she's, she's having fun. I think when she's just yeah. playing. How cute like, are the little amazing. zoomies, man? Yeah, yeah. And they are zoomies. You don't want to get in the way. Oh, and then they throw their rump around. You do not want to be no. on the arm. Um, and she smashes into walls and chairs and pretty hard too and doesn't seem to worry. No. Her. Occasionally she'll stop and then just keep going. Yep. She's, yeah, it's going to be great. Like, she's having a new enclosure built, isn't she? It's yeah. Well, starting very soon. Yeah. Because um, she had... What did she have? She had a FHO, ephemeral head osteopathy. Am I saying that word right? You can probably speed that up when you edit it. I'm hoping I, 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 think I can. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Yeah. So is that like a bone thing? It's definitely a bone thing. Yeah. yeah. She, so the, the head of the femur bone um, hadn't formed properly, so... You've heard of this? I should, know, I should know what this is because my son had it when he was born. <laughs> it happens to humans. It's yes. exactly right. Yeah. Um, and they can do hip replacements on people and, and even some dogs. But if there's no replacement hip available, like, say, for a wombat, they just round down those femur bones. Oh, wow. And they did both sides in uh, one, one operation, which was a big deal. And we were terrified. It took probably a good couple of months she was dragging her back legs around, um, and that was like a good day, you know. Um, it was really hard to watch, 
And now you'd never know. It was awful to watch early days, yeah. yeah. But yeah, now. So glad that, you know, you sort of stuck with it. Because there were points where you sort of went, this this isn't right. This just looks horrible. It was sad, yeah. you know. Um, but now, yeah, wow. Yeah, you know, my son didn't have that. Something slightly similar. What was it called? Um, a congenital hip, hip dysplasia or something like that. How the bones didn't, the hip joints didn't. I think it didn't, oh, okay. yeah. didn't do that. So he had to wear a yeah. brace for like nine months, uh, the first nine months of his life, to make it sort of force them to grow together. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's happened to a few southern hairy nodes um, I've since learnt about. And the only common theme is they were all on a particular brand of milk. I don't really want to say what it was. Mm. Um, but there's one line of thinking that maybe that brand of milk is more catered to perhaps the bald nosed wombats than the hairy nosed wombats. And. Some people are looking into it, so I won't say too much about it. But yeah. <laughs> well, nutrition um, down because they they are quite um, young when they're like born. They're quite young when they're born, are they? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm this. We, we will leave that in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's not going to talk no. now. <laughs> no. <laughs> say sorry. They're quite underdeveloped <laughs> when they're born. Uh, the mother's new. Um, there's the the milk and the lactation that they get is extremely important just like every other animal so if you've got a uh, if you're bottle feeding them and you're bottle feeding them inappropriately probably their their bones they're not going to function or or kind of form properly um how how young were the animals when they started being bottle fed well these are good questions yeah but it was actually a carer who um didn't you get snuffles three months i think she was a bit older than that was she i think so but she came to me um through a carer that said, this animal's exceptional. She's got a really good nature. She'd be great for what you do. And I said, nope, I don't want a wombat. <laughs> she said, well, how about you just raise her, have her while she's little, and then you can give her back. And I'm like, okay, that sounds good. And everybody said, you should keep her. I said, no, I'm not keeping her. Um, and then and here, we are. Yeah, here we are. Yeah, here we are. What is, what is it about them that makes them endear oh, to you? Oh, they're they're just, like... They're this. just so charismatic. They've, they've got strong personalities. They can look and just... Feel like an adorable dog that follows you around. Um, they can play with you. Um, the things you actually see when they don't think you're watching. So I was I was very fortunate to actually watch a lot of my infrared uh, cameras and just watch the footage and they just play and just we had a bowling ball and this wombat this like eight-year-old wombat was just rolling on top of this bowling ball. They've just got <laughs> such strong personalities and. Yeah, you're going to love her forever. But they are. A bit, I mean, I come home every night to I've got nearly 100 animals and about 10, 11 species of marsupial. And over the years of doing this, apart from having a dog, she's the only one that kind of cares that it's me coming in the door. Yeah. You know, all the other animals are like, that's somebody with food and that'll mm. do. Yeah. They do bond to you, don't they? They do. Yeah, they are. I think that's the best way to describe them. They're like a family dog. The, the, you know, a wild wombat is probably like a wild dog, uh, but a... a Tame one, but it's like a pet dog, and they have similar sort of personality. So you want to play, they want to run around, they want to follow you everywhere, uh, they want to roll on their back and give you a belly scratch or scratch their butt, they really love it. Mm. I think that's why I, I decided to keep her too, was like, I, I have to, she's bonded to us, this is, well, this I, is our I, home now. I don't think you would have if it weren't for the back legs, if it weren't for the operation that you had to go through and all of that. I think you probably would have let her go back. Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah maybe. Um, shared traumatic mm. experience. Because yeah, now she true. just bites the shit out of everyone. <laughs> she bites everyone except daddy. Except you, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't bite a daddy, not yet. Um, but, you know, I also stay away from her face. I mean, that's... Oh. I mean, we do animal handling here with the mm. students, and I always say... It sounds super obvious, but just stay away from the animal's mouth. I mean, it's super... I don't even feel comfortable saying it because it sounds condescending, but, yeah. Some, sometimes you've got to tell people that... Obvious. Yeah. <laughs> and they have very sharp teeth and they have very long, sharp claws as well. And so you, you don't want to be on their wrong side. And you know, not, it's, it's not, Snuffles is nice at home at the moment, but wait until he starts wanting to get out the back door and you know the door's locked and you're not there or something like that. You probably come home and find you haven't got a back door anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, they can run pretty fast, can't they? Uh, they have been test- They have been clocked up to 40 kilometres an hour. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's about... Usain Bolt sort of speed. But they haven't got any endurance. And that's the funny thing. We go out um, uh, catching wombats and it's 
should be set to Benny Hill, Hill music at uh, <laughs> watching us chase wombats because the way we do it is we uh, spotlight for them from the back of a truck and then we've got this giant uh, butterfly net, fish, fishing landing net sort of thing and you basically chase them across the paddock which is can be dangerous uh, at night running through a paddock full of wombat holes but generally you'll sort of if you sprint full speed you'll sort of keep up with them but as you tire they tire so it's generally a, a test to see who tires first i'm not very good at catching wombats because i'm old and slow uh, but some of the young students can keep up with them and they can catch them quite well so it's a stamina test yeah it is, it is <laughs> very much a stamina test you run out of puff they run out of puff very quickly so they use chasing as part of their uh, mating behaviour, their reproductive behaviour, and that, that courtship, um, that figure eight. So in captivity, you see them do lots of running, lots of figure eights, um, and it's almost a test of endurance. So a female will almost let the male um, or, um, mate with her if he can catch her. So, ah, because yeah. people ask me why can they run so fast? Because you, you, th- you think most animals that can run fast, it's to get away from predators or to chase their prey while they eat grass. Um, so that's, that's interesting. Yeah, so they, they'll either... Um, so a female does a lot of the dispersing. And uh, so, yeah, she might have a, a male or two actually uh, <laughs> and chase her. <laughs> so if she's, um, if she's willing, she'll kind of like go up to him and kind of make him chase her. Or um, she's like, no, I'm not having a bar of this and has to run away from him. It's so funny that they can do those feats of speed and yet there's no one training them. Yeah. Their legs are like tiny, <laughs> they're barrel shaped and they sleep all day and they eat grass. They don't it couldn't be have more opposite uh, <laughs> Usain Bolt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he can only run 100 metres or 200 metres as well, so a wombat probably not quite that far, but a you know, similar sort of thing. And I guess that's because they don't really go far from their burrows when they're eating, so they don't need to run very far to escape a predator. They just need to run to the nearest burrow. Mm. And if they're no more than 100 metres or so away, they, they'll escape. Mm. I wonder if there's a prehistoric, like back in the Pleistocene, a predator that was once there that was chasing them into their burrows that now doesn't exist. Well, the um, you know, Thylacoleo was you know, one of the fiercest predators around the continent of Australia back in those days. And, of course, then the, the Thylacine. Wombats are you know, in those days, the hairy nose wombat and the common wombat have been around, I think, for about three to five million years in their current form. Uh, but they also sort of shared the continent with the uh, diprotodon, which was you know, the size of a cow, uh, and they seen it's a pretty closely related animal. I don't think they burrowed. I can't imagine a diprotodon <laughs> burrow. It would be pretty big. Yeah, that'd be uh, huge. Uh, but, you know, the thylacoleo or the thylacine would have been the main predator of the wombats until the dingo sort of came along. But even a, a, a full-grown dingo would, uh, well, a dingo would have problems taking a, down a full grown wombat it would need several dingoes or oh, have to be an old sick wombat or a young wombat uh, so they really don't have any predators they haven't had predators on this country for a very long time yeah and there was some other species of thylacine like some really big species of thylacine so i don't know whether they lived alongside the wombats too yeah mm. interesting mm, yeah wombats are not really i mean if you look at uh, how uh, different wild animals are uh, sort of their population is regulated in size. Uh, wombats are not one of these predator uh, or top down um, suppression on their numbers. It's more bottom up, it's resource limitations. So, uh, drought, whilst it's terrible to look at, and you know, be, going out looking at the wombat population over the last few years with the drought, whilst it can be di- pretty distressing to look at, realistically speaking, that's about the only thing that keeps the numbers in check. The only other predator they'd have these days would be people. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Ab- Aboriginal people ate them then, they still do in some places. Yep. Uh, they're quite an important totem in um, some, some uh, group family groups uh, on the Gawler Ranges where Snuffles comes from. I suspect he might have been left over from his mum, might have been eaten or something like that, I don't know. Uh, this was a car accident, but that certainly oh. happens too, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah so they come in, young ones come into care sometimes that way. Yeah. So when you're chasing these animals, what do you do when you get up to it? You drop the big net over there um, and then hang on until help arrives, basically. <laughs> uh, and it, it basically you scoop them up out of the net. Um, well, you don't actually take them out of the... You don't take them out of... Physically take them out of the net. We up in the net over a hessian bag. Uh, and then once they're in the bag, it's like hand-raised animals. They sort of quieten down. They almost go to sleep. Uh, and then 
uh, we inject them with a sleeping thing uh, and then take them out and do all our tests on them. What were you specifically looking for with these animals? Depends what the research task is and who's doing the research. Um, we have been doing a uh, place called Kalula, which is a station just south of uh, Blanchetown. We've been doing research there for about 30 years and so we got looking at the, how, how the population has been changing over that time, whether the animals have been changing, how they've been breeding, etc. keeping a very close eye on all the population dynamics. Do you want to discuss that at all, the research? Oh, sure. I mean, there's so many different types of research we're doing. Um, my specific, my specific re- um, research, I did both hairy nose populations uh, and how the population has changed over time, over the last, you know, since Europeans have arrived and even going back in time before that, um, and seeing how the population has varied in time, uh, in, in numbers and in locations, um, and then looking at things like what affects the population, you know, what uh, climate, land use, um, that sort of thing, what, what influences the population numbers, and where wombats can be found, where they can't be found. And that's important because we want to know what's going to happen in the future. Um, with things like climate change, how is that going to affect the wombat population? Do we need to start protecting them now, or are they going to be fine? What is the thinking? I know there's no crystal balls on these things, and that's a horrible question, but what is the thoughts about the future of the wombat? The future of wombat is mixed, can it best I be say, the southern hearing has wombat at least anyway. Uh, whilst uh, climate change will adversely affect the species, uh, and that's mainly because um, the variability of the rainfall out west will, will probably increase, so there'll be more drought periods, and the drought periods will be longer and more intense. Uh, so that means that as I said earlier about the breeding, uh, will affect the breeding cycle. And so you probably have much longer periods where the population crashes before recovering. Um, but whilst that's a negative, an interesting positive that we're thinking about is a lot of the land out west uh, where right now the human conflict is with wombats is because of um, wombats in cropland. But if uh, the climate changes the way we predict, a lot of that land might be suitable for cropping anymore. Uh, and it might have to go back to grazing. And if it goes back to grazing, that will favour the wombat. So areas where they're currently being excluded from because of croplands, uh, they might start to move back into those territories. Why is it that the grazing land isn't such a problem for the wombats? Is that because there's no tractors moving across that land? Essentially, yeah. I mean, farmers, most farmers are not actually enamoured having huge colonies of wombats on their property, uh, but, you know, grazing farmers, you know, sheep graziers or, or cattle graziers, or whatever, sort of shrug their shoulders a bit and go, oh, oh well, yeah. Have you been to that um, tourist place up on Big Bend, just out of Swan Reach? They've got... Um, you've been there? I have, yes. Yeah, they, they do tour. It's like, it's all paddocks. I, I don't know what they did there once upon a time. Maybe they had sheep, but now they do night tours with the wombats. They do a bit of a show during the day too. People get off the houseboats and come and do a show but we drove to it through the bush and we saw dozens of wombats on the way there then we got there they put us in the back of a tractor and they towed us around we put blankets on us and we went spotlighting saw a 20 frog mouth and one wombat in their paddocks so i recommend driving to it and then driving back again (laughs) (laughs) and then home yeah yeah (laughs) the best time to see wombats if you want to go see southern herring's wombats the best time to do it is about eh, let's say about an hour or so before dusk uh, because they'll start coming up uh, and they'll just sort of sit on their burrows sometimes, just almost like they're warming up um, and then before they go out to feed or whatever in the night. And so it's a good time to see them then. Sometimes so, you see them in the middle of the day, but, you know, at, you know, if you want to wait till midnight, you can go and see them. But uh, yeah. So about an hour before the sun goes down? Yeah. So, uh, and not too windy, not too hot, not too cold. So it's going to be just a night, so a nice day, <laughs> about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So can they do something like... Like a torpor, where they, they might not come out of their burrows for a few days and just not eat or drink for a few days? That's a very interesting question. I'm glad you asked that one because I actually have a theory that they do Skip go into... past this then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a theory that they do go into some sort of torpor because they can stay down in the burrows for up to about 10 days. And that's been known you know, ever since day one, uh, that the southern hairy nose and the northern hairy nose can stay down there for up to 10 days and not come out. Um, they actually... Uh, sort of barricade themselves in. They'll sort of collapse a bit of the tunnel in front of them. So they have almost sealed themselves into a very small room. And what that does means that any moisture that they expel with their breath is sort of trapped in there. Uh, and they can rebreathe the, the, the moist air and that lowers their water uh, necessity. But of course, as you might imagine, uh, if you and I did that, we'd die of suffocation or thirst within a few minutes. And wombats do it 
survive it quite well. So I have a, a theory uh, that uh, they do go into some sort of torpor because they also have very low food requirements anyway, much lower than you would think for an animal of that size. And so my theory that tends to fit all the facts is that they do sort of go into a sort of semi-torpor when they go underground, but we haven't tested it, we can't prove it, and so it's something, some an area of active research that I would like to pursue in the future. They, they certainly have low oxygen requirements because when we got some x-rays on Snuffles, the doctor put the, uh, the gas on her face and she's just looking around, everything's cool, what's happening, what's going on? I'm starting to feel sleepy, I'm on the other side of the room. <laughs> she's wide awake, yeah, very different to a dog or a cat. Hmm. Yeah. Well, marsupials have a, um, a 30% lower um, field, meta- field metabolic rate than the equivalent size eutherian mammals, uh, just naturally. Uh, but and a lot of Australian native animals do go into sort of semi-torpor. Some of the things like squirrel gliders and stuff like that almost almost semi-hibernate. And I think uh, hairy nose bombats do as well. But as I said, it's a theory that I need to test. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think wombats because wombats are fairly, although they diverged quite some time ago, they're closely related to koalas, aren't they? That's correct. Yeah. And when I'm outside and I'm looking at the weather sometimes, because I've got koalas on my property, like wild ones, and it, could be hailing out there, it could be really, really hot out there, and I'm thinking, and their cousins are under the ground where it's nice, you know. <laughs> yeah. They, so they're the, the sensible relatives. I wonder. Of course. I wonder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I, another interesting aside, I'm sorry, I'm dominating oh. all the conversation here. An interesting thing about wombats uh, is that they have a backwards facing pouch. Um, and uh, everyone says that oh, this is to stop the dirt. When the mother's digging, stop all the dirt getting in the joey's face. And I think that's rubbish. Uh, of course, koalas have a backwards-facing pouch as well, uh, which doesn't seem like a sensible adaption for an animal that lives up in a tree because Joey just falls <laughs> out. <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> um, um, and they are closely related. I think it's, um, I think it's a um, vestigial adaption from an earlier species that um, good for the wombats, but you know, it doesn't work for the koalas. But it's, I don't think it's got anything to do with um, filling up with dirt. It's probably something like... Uh, say like a diprotodon, which is much larger animal, it would make sense that the joey would come out backwards rather than forwards. And it might be because of that. I don't know. But that's just another one that... Um, it's one of those things, old wives' tales, that doesn't, doesn't hold water when you analyse it. Yeah, OK, that's interesting. Because I, I thought the same thing. Because bilbies burrow and have a backwards opening pouch, mm. but then so do bandicoots and they don't burrow. So, Elise, what was your work about? So I did reproduction to kind of optimise the or understand their reproduction as a conservation tool for breeding northern hairy-nosed wombats. So that was my focus. So I looked at all the, the captive behaviours and figure out why they're not breeding in captivity. And so that's obviously important because we want to be able to breed these guys in captivity. So um, what, what did you learn f- through doing that? Uh, so actually, <laughs> one, of the, one of the challenges with my research was that you can't really get the same amount of information and data from uh, animals in the wild. So I was fortunate that I could collect biological samples, non-invasive biological samples from breeding females over two breeding seasons, and I was collecting them every day so I could see those profiles in their reproductive hormones and their changes over time throughout the breeding season. Now, um, ideally, we want to then try and to hopefully then understand that this is what's happening in the wild as well but we just don't have that same level of information you can't go out in the wild and collect a sample from a known individual every day Um, but one of the really interesting things was that we were able to to um, profile these these females and just like their personalities their hormone profiles are just as variable with with these um, with these females and we're not quite sure if it is um, a factor of being in captivity. Some animals were hand raised as as, as pouch young um, or little pinkies. Others were juveniles when they came in, and, and other females were adults when they came uh, rescued adults. Um, so there's a high level of variability in the females. Um, and then, so how you try and then um, sort of relate this or, or adapt it into a breeding program then is is really difficult. So. When you say you collected biological samples from the animals, what, what does that entail? So I was collecting... So non-invasive was a very big part of my project. I wanted to be able to collect a sample that um, really didn't interfere much with the animal's natural behaviour. So for the most part, I collected fresh faecal samples, but... Um, 
<laughs> but um, the digestive system um, takes three days to basically pass through, so their profiles for their hormones, there's nothing rapid. I can't collect a blood sample, so I trained wombats to urinate on demand. Oh, really? Yep. So I, um, I was, uh, so the first two months of my PhD was spent um, training a bunch of females to, to wee, and then for the next two years, I was collecting urine samples, and I collected nearly, what, three, four thousand, three thousand? I'm going to say three thousand urine samples. Um, Whoa, from you number trained. I train them. <laughs> so this is a really good tip for you um, with snuffles. <laughs> you can toilet train a wombat. So in the pouch, a mother will um, stimulate the cloaca to kind of um, eliminate the waste of their pouch young. So that's that stimulation. So it's kind of reinforced when they're when they're in the pouch. So I did a very similar technique, and I just lightly tapped around the area of their tail, their adorable little tail. And so I wake them up, and the first thing that an animal does, humans are like, when you wake up, is you need to pee. And so I would associate the tapping with the natural behaviour, and so then over time they associated the tapping with urinating. <laughs> and so I had one of those little single egg frying pans. They're only this big. It slid right on the animal, perfect height. I just lightly tapped their bum and I'd collect a sample. And in the beginning, it, I actually published a paper on this. Wow. So I timed it <laughs> and, you know, it went from like four or five minutes down to um, seconds for doing that. So that's it was, quite amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So, um, it's an effective way of toilet training your animals. So if you're going to do a show and you don't want them to eliminate waste in the middle of a show, you can kind of train them before. Quickly, go pee. What have you done that's similar, Adrian? Well, when, I was, when she was being raised, I'd get a, a big beer glass and I'd just sort of hold it up in my lap and just stimulate the lip of the beer glass on her cloaca and she would fill half of that glass and it looked like beer. <laughs> But I was careful never to leave it lying around. Uh, <laughs> Especially when Steve's here. <laughs> <laughs> like, thanks, mate. Yeah, um, yeah so the, the urine is really concentrated it's because um, their diet, they don't drink a lot of water. And so um, then I was able to try and kind of... I wanted to look at non-invasive measures of changes in their urine to see if that could be associated with their Easter cycle. So a lot of your smaller animals your dunarts, they uh, shed epithelial cells. So there are a lot of um, successful breeding programs in captivity that use just a, they analyse just a drop of urine just to have a look at epithelial cell concentration or even the actual concentration of the urine to determine if female is in season. And that's the optimum time of, of breeding. So they kind of base their breeding programs around this natural cyclicity. And I was hoping to look at the same with females in uh, female wombats. And so I did find those changes so their urine would get quite concentrated and they would have that increase of epithelial cells. So that was really good. So these are non-invasive measures that you can look at to see if, if the female like, is biologically ready to mate. And then I paired that with behaviour. So then I could look at how, how these changes, is she more active, is she more aggressive and things like that. So I was really trying to optimise non-invasive measures of, of reproduction to improve the breeding program because they don't breed well in captivity but it's one of those things where you do have to watch the animal repeatedly so I was, I was watching behavioral footage every day and collecting those samples every day so then I could really monitor those changes. Now talking about fecal matter, wombat's poo is cubed and everybody's got a theory on why that is. is it? Oh you've said <laughs> something wrong. Oh, what have I done? You've oh. done something wrong. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to correct you there. Please do. Wombat Please do. Cubes poo is not cube shaped. It common wombat bear nose wombat is sort of cuboidal. Southern hairy nose wombat poos are not. Uh, not. Please repeat after me. Southern hairy nose wombat poos are not, not. like cubes. Now, what no. does snuffles look like? Well, hers aren't cute, but I looked it up and it, there was one theory that in captivity they've got access to water all the time, so potentially the cube poos are a water retention technique. Yeah, yeah the, the, best, the best shape, most southern hearing is wombat poos are sort of all sorts of random shapes, actually, but they, they sort of, the best would be a sort of pillowy shape. Yeah. Uh, they're sort of... Elliptical. Yeah, cu yeah cubish, but quite rounded... 
corners Why and things like that. hard chocolates with the really hard centres and they're covered in chocolate? And they've got like <laughs> not clinkers. Yeah, that's kind of yeah, what okay. Like. Yeah, they're yeah. like clinkers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And the um, <laughs> but the reason why the reason why they are not nice and circular like yours and mine. Um, well, I don't know what yours are like. But <laughs> You're generalising. Yeah, yeah. Generalising. Yeah. Mine, mine are very square. Yeah. <laughs> the reason they do, the reason they are sort of more cubic shape, if you will, is uh, because the the gut has weak points, so it doesn't stretch nice and round like like this. It sort of becomes sort of distorted, and so instead of having this nice cylindrical shape passing through you, it has all these distortions in the um, uh, gut, which, which forces it to be more a, a more a flat shape on the sides, um, and the reason uh, that the people have put forth reasons, um, things like they stack them to mark their territories yeah. and all sorts of things like yeah. that, or stop them rolling down the hills. And well, southern herring those wombats don't live on the hills for a start; they live on flat ground. So that blows that theory out of the water. Uh, I'm pretty confident the reason has nothing to do with that. They're sort of they're sort of um, uh, a um, Fun story. Co- collateral uh, impact of the, the shape. And it has to do with because they live in a very arid environment, uh, they have to extract the maximum amount of moisture possible from any food that's passing through their gut. And a circular shape is the worst to do that because it has the, has the most volume for the least surface area, whereas a flat surface has a higher surface area to volume um, ratio and therefore there's more area to extract water uh, from the food. Because somebody grabbed a wombat intestine and inflated it, didn't they? Yes, they did, yes. Yeah. And it wasn't, like you say, it wasn't, it wasn't cylindrical at all. It had um, almost, yeah, corners yeah. and yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, yeah. yeah I, one of our colleagues from the University of Tasmania was involved in that, a guy called Scott Carver. Yeah. Shout out to Scott. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So in captivity, they they poo more frequently. Yes, you're absolutely right. They're fed more regularly and they have access to water. Um, But the the poos that I was collecting, they come out like little love hearts. They come out big, (laughs) small, and there is lots of them. But generally in in the wild, it can take like five days to 14 days to pass. I have. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. If you look at my Facebook page, I have a uh, oh, where I put a lot of my research. Uh, it's <laughs> called uh, Southern Herring Nose Wombats: The Science, uh, and there are a lot, a lot of pictures of Southern Herring Nose Wombat poos on there, and so you can look at them yourselves and see they're not square. Um, and I have a freezer full of wombat poo at home as well. You might ask me why. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> no, we'll leave it. We'll leave it. <laughs> Everyone has a hobby. <laughs> um, I do want to ask why. <laughs> yeah. Steve, yeah. Uh, no, the reason we, we, we um, uh, collect them for uh, DNA analysis, and you can look at the uh, epithelial cells on the outside of the um, poos and determine uh, the genetics of the animal uh, that did it. And so we can look at um, populations and how they're related to each other. Uh, and then you can analyse the poo itself and work out what they're eating. So it's an extremely good way of um, doing lots of research, going around picking up wombat poo. Yeah. So in the wild, they normally eat in, like, ideally things like Ostrostipa, like the spear grasses and things, but that's not always around now. We've changed the landscape. Do they, have they learnt to eat introduced species? Wombats are quite an op- opportunistic feeder. Uh, whilst the, the theory is they'll eat the grasses, particularly the type of grasses and things like that, um, there's very little of that around in a lot of the places where they live, and so they'll eat all sorts of things. So they, they, they'll browse on shrubs like uh, blue bush and salt bush. They'll eat the introduced weeds, uh, ward's weed, which is not very good for them, but they'll still eat it. Uh, but they actually seem to prefer, particularly out uh, around the Murraylands area, uh, they dig up the... Um, thread iris. The thread iris bulbs. Um, and... Uh, we've actually uh, put exclosure plots where we've reintroduced the type of grass and let them regrow, and the wombats don't recognise it as food anymore. They'll, they'll prefer the thread iris bulbs. And it, it may well be that bulbs are more nutritious than grasses anyway, so it might well be not that they prefer them, it's just it's better food. I've seen it where uh, people have put in native grasses for the kangaroos and they just hop straight past them and they'll go eat the kaikuyu because it's just so much more nutritious and succulent. Yeah. yeah, they say the same thing. I think that's why cattle prefer the um, uh, buffalo grass. Uh, that's why farmers plant it because it's uh, more nutritious for the animals. And I don't know how good it is for the native animals, but i um, not an expert on grasses. But yeah. I, I do see what they eat out in these places. And if you look at 
particularly out in the Murray lands, and we go out there sometimes, and the whole you can see the whole paddocks have been there's all these pits where they've just dug the whole paddock up. It looks like a looks like a um, the whole paddock's been turned into um, bubble wrap. Uh, with all these little holes everywhere where the animals have been digging up these um, bulbs. Yeah. Oh, can, I t- can I tell you a story? I want to can you? I have, oh, I have, this I have, is a good story. This is my favourite, is my favourite story about southern herring as one bets, and uh, it'll take me five minutes, but if you bear with me. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. Five. <laughs> um, uh, I, I talk a lot about my work uh, to audiences uh, and uh, in South Australia, but you ask the typical South Australian audience what the native animal of South Australia is, and... More than 50% will say the bird that's on the flag, the piping shrike or the Murray, Mag- Murray magpie. It's not. The southern hairy nose wombat is the faunal emblem of South Australia. Um, it, and it, it's not just a random thing. It is one of the most richly deserved titles in the world uh, because not only is it almost exclusively a South Australian animal, there are some in, in Western Australia, um, it also once played a fundamental role in saving the state's economy and in fact, this very university where we are now, the University of Adelaide, owes its very existence to a southern hairiness wombat. Well, uh, you, oh, exactly. <laughs> you don't know why that is the case. Back in 1859, uh, there was a shepherd uh, wandering around the, a paddock, wandering, uh, tending his sheep um, up on a property near Kadena on the York Peninsula when he came across some unusual rocks. Those rocks turned out to be copper ore, and those rocks had been dug up by a wombat when it had been digging its burrow. That copper ore, they actually excavated underneath the wombat warren, and it turned up one of the richest copper finds ever, and sort of very important in the development of the the state's economy. That mine became known as the wombat mine, (laughs) and if you go up to Moonta and Wallaroo and Kadena today, there are all sorts of memorials to wombats. There's, in the middle of Munta, go into the park in Munta, there's actually a, two statues of wombats yes, there are. telling the story. Yep. Uh, the hotel in Kadena is called the Wombat Hotel to this day uh, because of this. And the miners so loved wombats for digging up copper and helping them find copper that they actually protected them. They exempted them from hunting and attacked by dog. It's the first Australian native animal to be protected in this fashion, albeit only on a fairly small scale. Wow. Now, more interestingly, the guy who owned the property where the copper was first found was a guy called Walter Watson Hughes. Now, Walter Watson Hughes was a bit of a... had his fingers in all sorts of pies. He was a ship's captain, he was a seaman, uh, he was a landholder, and he became, as you might imagine extraordinarily rich from this copper. It was the first copper mine to return more than like a million pounds in profits or something like that. It was really, really important. In 1874, Walter Watson Hughes donated a sum of 20,000 pounds, which money he made from a wombat finding copper on his property to found the University of Adelaide. Really? Look at that. There you go. I knew they were the fauna, faunal emblem mm. in South Australia, but I had no idea why. Mm. And if you look around the University of Adelaide, Hughes didn't have a lot of money to uh, start the mine initially, so he got funding from a consortium of businessmen. Uh, Thomas Elder was one of them. Um, Robert Sterling, and the other guy was a guy called, I think it was Peter, but I can't remember his first name, Temple Smith. Now, uh, Bar Smith, sorry. Now, the Bar Smith Library is the main library in the North Terrace campus of the University of Adelaide, and Elder Hall is one of the big buildings on the thing. So we have a, there's a very big connection between the University of Adelaide and this wombat digging up copper on Hughes' property. That's brilliant. Wow. That is That's absolutely good brilliant. Story. Yeah, and they That's protected great. them back then. They did. Let's start that up again. Yeah, <laughs> um, mate. What was, can you say the name of your Facebook page again if people want to follow that? And it's called uh, Southern Hairy Nose Wombats: The Science. We'll put a link to that on the on the on the website. Mm. Lots of pictures, lots of videos. Um, yeah, lots of information about Southern Hairy Nose Wombats. That's great, guys. Thank you so Thanks much for your so time. Much. That was awesome. And guys, thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.